after having doing research in a paper for a seminary, I want to share with you something that I think is actually pretty cool. I think it'll bless you. And that comes from the story of Philemon. Really, the story is about Onesimus who ran away and Paul is urging, uh, appealing to uh, Philemon, who is the owner, the master of Onesimus, to treat him as he's a brother. Before I go there, I want to read something from, me, from, the, from the 13th Amendment. Most of us have an idea of what slavery is like or what we've been told it's like either from watching movies and so forth uh, here in America. But let me just read something because we think that slavery has been abolished. And I want to point out something to you. Uh, I'm going to read this from the, from the 13th Amendment. It says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted uh, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So in other words, slavery has not been abolished in America. Slavery still exists, or I should say involuntary servitude still exists if a person is incarcerated, if a person is in prison. In other words, the prison can make a person do work. Now, if they don't, there are certain ramifications. They can't beat you. They can't give you a longer sentence. But they can take things away from you, put, in, put you in certain units and so forth, put you on restrictions. You can't go to commissary, all those different things like that. You can't get, uh, maybe take away your, your good time that you may have earned. Those things that they can do to punish a person for not doing the work they required. Why is that important? Well, Paul, who is a prisoner, knows what it's like to be a prisoner. Paul knows what it's like to, to be in chains, to have chains on. He's writing on behalf of Onesimus. Now, we don't know how Onesimus became a slave. We don't even know why Onesimus ran away, although the Bible says that uh, if there's something that he owes uh, to Philemon, well, then to credit. As a matter of fact, let's go to, uh, let's go to Philemon and let's go to verse, let's start in verse eight. Therefore, though I have in enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ. So notice what he, how he conveys this speaking of himself as a prisoner himself who understands what it's like to be forced to do something to be controlled, not just by the authorities themselves, but also by Christ. And he's not appealing to Onesimus, I'm sorry, to Philemon on the basis of him being his senior in terms of him owing him, but as a brother. Why is that important? Well, because there are also some rules that the old covenant uh, could Paul could probably say, well, this is what the Lord wants us to do in terms of how we treat slaves and so forth. And in that time, if you were a runaway slave, slavery was a was a vital part, was just an integral role in society then. It was not abolished. Um, but I want you to see how Paul does something and it actually ends up becoming how we end up dealing with slavery, not just at that time, but even going forward, even here with eradicating slavery in America. But Paul appeals to him on a different level as a brother uh, in the Lord, as a prisoner of Christ. And he says, verse 10, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. Now, is that to say that Onesimus became a believer um, after running into Christ? I mean, after running into Paul? We don't know, but likely. I think that's probably the way. Now, slaves at that time did have the ability to go and uh, look for some sort of mediation. They were They had better rights than what you would have saw as slaves here in America did, but not a lot. Uh, they did have some rights. There are various reasons why a person could be a slave. They could be a slave because they were born into it. Um, sometimes folks have babies and they throw the babies away and they pick the baby up uh, and then someone sells them off for slavery. Sometimes a person can become a slave because of a debt, either voluntarily or involuntarily in indebted themselves to servitude. It could be for some sort of penal reason. In other words, they have been convicted of a crime and now they are caused to work off their debt to society or even a financial debt by this way. And there might be a link. You also have what's called manumission where a person can receive their freedom. Now, the difference is with America versus then is that freedom uh, or I'm sorry, slavery was not based on race. So if a person ran away, unless they told you, unless you knew about the person, you would know the person would just fit in with, with society. And so if a person had the means, they might go after and retrieve this, this slave. But if they didn't have the means, that then the slave might get away. There's also the possibility that a, that a slave could kill his master because upon his death, then maybe this servitude would end. Uh, sometimes, though, they, they may have already willed that that slave would go to their descendants and so forth. But all that being stated, we don't know why Onesimus became a slave. 
We don't know why he's running away. Paul makes a statement who formerly was useless to you, um, but now is useful both to you and to me. Now, we don't know what that means, why he says he was formerly useless. Does that mean that he was not a good worker, that he's not doing his job? Not sure. Now, the name Onesimus was a common name given to slaves, not a name that they were born with, but a name that they were given. And so this Onesimus, could it have been his real name? It could have been. It also was a name that was given to slaves. And so Paul is saying, uh, who was formerly useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. And he's speaking, I think, in terms of him being useful to the kingdom. And maybe Paul was saying he was useless in regards to the kingdom. Not sure. Not sure. He says, I have sent him back to you in person. That is sending my very heart. In other words, me doing this, consider this to be something very dear to me. And I'm sending him to you. He says, whom I wish to keep with me so that on your behalf, he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. And so Paul said, I would like to use him, but I want to send him back to you. You would think that's a pretty dangerous move, at least as far as this is concerned, because go back. What if he doesn't, what if he doesn't accept your appeal and he takes me back as a slave? Uh, but without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion. In other words, I, won't, I don't want you to make you do something. I don't want you to feel guilty about it. I want you to do this freely for perhaps he was, uh, for this reason, separated from you uh, for a while that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. So now he's appealing to Philemon in a particular manner in a particular way, not under some sort of compulsion. Hey, you owe me this also, not for that reason either. But what he says, if then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Someone may say, well, maybe Onismus did something wrong, incurred a debt, stole something. Don't know. We, it doesn't, we don't know. But Paul says, whatever he has done, whatever he owes you, charge it to my account because you owe me. As a matter of fact, he says, I am Paul. Um, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self as well. So Paul kind of throws it in there. Listen, you owe me as well. Uh, yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Now, what I want you to notice is what he says to him. And this is kind of odd. Remember, where is Paul? Paul is in imprisonment. Paul not doesn't necessarily have an expectation of living too long. Now, this is the imprisonment that he, this is not where he's going to die. This is about a couple of years prior to him dying, but Paul understands that he is going to die for the gospel at some point in time. And so Paul is making a strange request with that being known. He says, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, also, look what he says, prepare me a lodging. For I hope that through your prayers, I will be given to you. In light of Paul knowing that at some point in time, he is going to die. And he and even if he doesn't die now, he's got other missions that he would like to do. The likelihood of, of going to see uh, Philemon is small. And Paul knows this. But he says, prepare lodging for me. Do you think that Paul, I kind of think so. I don't, I don't know if this be the case, but I kind of think so. Uh, Consider him like me. Treat him like a brother and even more so. Oh, by the way, prepare a lodging for me. What's the likelihood that Onesimus will receive this lodging? Because he's no longer a slave. He would be received not as a slave, but as a brother. Now, here's what we do know. Well, what we think we know. Uh, there are those that have written, and it's hard to tell, but there later becomes a bishop. There later becomes a servant in the church of Ephesus named Onesimus, who was a former, we believe to be a former slave. Is this the same person? It's kind of coincidental. If it's not, it may not be though. It may not be, but a lot of people have, have come to accept that this might be the very same Onesimus who is now useful in the ministry. Think about that now. Paul says that he can be useful if this is the same uh, Onesimus. Certainly he is useful. Now, here's something else that happens, and we don't talk about this, but how Paul appeals to Philemon becomes widely known. His letter to Philemon becomes kind of an industry standard, so much so that Pliny the Younger, 
who is not a believer, as a matter of fact, has no love for Christians, uses this tact when also appealing on behalf of another friend, not out of compulsion, not saying that you must do this, not under threat, but because you owe me, I love you and so forth. He, he writes the same sort of letter. Now, I want you to think about this. How do we deal with slavery in the Western world? We didn't deal with it in terms, now obviously we wanted the laws change, but how this was done was following the same pattern, appealing to the goodness and kindness of the person's heart, but also putting upon them who those folks who claim to be a Christian. Now, obviously all slave masters and slaveholders were not Christian. That's not what I'm saying. But you would still appeal to them in that same vein, the very same way that Paul appeals to Onesimus, we see that at the beginning of the ending of the slave trade. That's how they initially appealed. Is that the only way they appealed? I'm not saying that. But initially, for these good God-fearing men, whether they were or not, that's how it was coupled. That's how it was put out for these good God-fearing men to do the same thing, follow the same way that Paul appealed to Philemon. He's appealing to other men. And so you started seeing men and women, and there were those who actually were Christian, because again, it was possible at this time to be a, a believer in Christ and have masters. Someone might say that, no, you couldn't be a slave owner and be a Christian. Well, exhibit A, Philemon. Philemon was a Christian. Philemon has slaves, and Philemon is appealed to as a Christian. Paul didn't say you're not a, you're not a believer because you have slaves. This was kind of the society that they lived in. Some slaves were treated harsher. Some were treated better. Some were like members of the family. The slave himself would rather be free, though. Let's just be honest. It's not as though that he really, he rather enjoyed being a slave. He would much rather be free. And so is it possible that there were slave masters, slave holders that were believers in Christ, but may have been ignorant to the plight of these slaves, not even thinking about it? That happens a lot. And, and again, Philemon is one such one. We have a lot of people in the Bible who owned slaves, who had servants and slaves who were under the control of a master. Think about Abraham and I, I'm sorry, think about Abraham and Sarah. Uh, Hagar was a maid servant. And so she ran away. God tells, him to, tells her to go back. So you have that. And so it's possible, matter of fact, more, not even possible, it's true that there were people that had slaves who were ignorant of certain things, didn't think it through, owned slaves, and they were appealed to be on the basis of them being a Christian. That was the strategy for a lot of people to begin or to lay the foundation for abolishing slavery. Then as it took hold, all you need is enough influential people who are believers to see this and then to look at this very letter that we have in our Bible as a roadmap, as a strategy to release slaves. And if enough influential people have it, those with pockets, they have influence in their different parliaments and in Congress and so forth. Even in our own governmental pages, we see terms like all men are created equal and endowed by certain inalienable rights by their creator. And so we see the influence of the Bible, even in our own government. I said that our government is a Christian government and it's perfect. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is the influence on this little letter here has long lasting influence, even on people who are not Christians, even on people who are not believers, even on folks that claim to be Christian, but we're not even on wicked people. The influence of this letter has a far reaching effect, not just on Onesimus, who may very well have been also a bishop in the church of Ephesus, but also for other people to enjoy the freedoms that's afforded to them by the Lord that the Lord wants them to have, but also freedoms in the Lord. And Paul appears, appeals to them, and Paul appeals to them as a brother in Christ, begging or appealing to them to also view the other person, the one that's enslaved, as a fellow image bearer, as a fellow brother or sister in Christ. How awesome is this one little letter? How awesome is the effect on this letter to the rest of the world? Amen.